an ordinary government building. Nine floors of glass and steel reinforced concrete, built to code, built to last. Then one morning, a crude bomb causes destruction on an unimaginable scale. In seven seconds, the building disintegrates. 168 people will die as a result of the explosion. Now, with cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful moments in those final seconds from disaster. The United States. Midwest. Kansas. April 18, 1995. 4.30 in the morning, a truck pulls out of a motel in Kansas. Three hours later, it drives off the road and parks beside a lake. The driver is on a mission against the American government. He fills 13 208-liter barrels with a deadly combination of chemicals. The next day, April 19, he drives the Ryder rental truck and its lethal cargo south on Route 77. Every hour takes him closer to his target. Even the date he has chosen deliberately. Exactly two years before, in Waco, Texas, federal agents storm a militia compound. At least 75 people die. During the siege, the man visits Waco to show his support for the armed resistors inside. He blames the U.S. government for their deaths and vows revenge. His name is Timothy McVeigh. Oklahoma. It's the start of a bright and sunny day. Early morning traffic heads for the bustling capital of this Midwestern state. 7 o'clock. Timothy McVeigh, the rider truck, and its deadly cargo join the flow of vehicles going south along Highway 77. Ahead, out of the plains, rises Oklahoma City. A regional center in the American heartland where numerous government agencies are located in one particular building. The nine-story Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building houses 16 federal agencies, including housing and urban development, a military recruiting office, and the Secret Service. Built 18 years earlier, the Murrah was a modern purpose-built office block with a glass atrium and a wide pedestrian plaza at its front off Robinson Avenue. And at its rear, the glass-fronted facade towers above Fifth Street. The first floor of the Murrah is a daycare center. Employees in the Murrah and other downtown offices leave their children here while at work. One of them is 35-year-old Dolores Watson. This morning, she heads in early to drop off her 20-month-old grandson, PJ. PJ is full of life. He just pulled off his coat and little jacket. He was happy. He was ready to go play. PJ joins 20 other toddlers and preschoolers in the daycare center. Some are as young as six months. The eldest is five years old. I was able to see him during the course of the day. He was accessible to me from my job. Dolores, a telephone engineer, often services the phones in the Murrah. But this morning, she heads across town to a meeting. 8.15. McVeigh is 35 minutes away from Oklahoma City, heading straight for the center of town and the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building. On the second floor, 59-year-old Florence Rogers is in charge of the Federal Employees Credit Union. She's looking forward to seeing colleagues as it's her first day back from vacation. I was anxious to get to work because I had scheduled a meeting with some of my uh, upper management people. 
I was very excited to show my cruise pictures, anxious to get my day started and to take care of business. 8.53. Timothy McVeigh is in rush hour traffic that fills the downtown streets. Four months earlier, he checked out the Murrah and selected it as his target. His plan is to park the truck filled with explosives right beside it. 8.55. The Social Security office is on the ground floor of the Murrah. Inside, 20-year-old Dana Bradley, her children, mother and sister, join the waiting line. They're standing near the rear entrance of the building, just off 5th Street. My mom stood in line for us, while me and my sister stood by the door and uh, filled out the papers for the Social Security card for my son. Driving along 5th Street, McVeigh's truck is filmed by a security camera. He pulls over. Inside the cab, he's drilled a hole and fed a crude fuse wire through to the bomb barrels in the back. He lights the fuse. He now has only five minutes to park the truck and make his getaway before the bomb explodes. Nine o'clock. The rider truck is forced to stop at a red light, 91 meters shy of the target. There are just two minutes left to burn on the fuse. McVeigh crosses Harvey Avenue and drives to the rear of the Murrah building. Dana Bradley, still waiting in line, spots the truck from the ground floor window. I am turned around and I see a van, a moving truck, in front of the Social Security office. 9.01. On the second floor, Florence's meeting is underway. There were eight, and I was the ninth person in that little group. On the first floor, PJ and the other 20 children enjoy breakfast. And on the ground floor, Dana is still watching the truck. The driver gets out, goes to the back, and walks past our window. 9.01 and 30 seconds, McVeigh walks away. There are now 361 people inside the Murrah building. The fuse has just 43 seconds before it explodes the bomb. Timothy McVeigh parks a rider truck packed with explosives outside the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Now, using advanced computer technology, we'll discover what really happens when the bomb explodes. 9.02. The fuse has just 30 seconds to burn. 361 people are in the Murrah building. Dana Bradley is on the ground floor in direct line of the blast. All I seen was a violet light and everything was black. On the second floor, Florence Rogers is in a meeting with eight of her staff. There was a rush of air like a tornado. Everything literally was blowing up before my eyes. I knew that was just it and I prayed. I said, God, please save me. I have two kids to take care of. Dolores Watson's grandson is in the daycare center on the first floor, directly above the exploding truck. The entire front of the federal building was nothing but glass. The children that were in the windows were just over the glass. It takes seven seconds for the nine-story building to collapse in ruins. The blast devastates 324 buildings over 10 city blocks. Windows shatter and cars erupt in flames. 
people hear it as far as 89 kilometers away. The shockwave registers six on the Richter scale, equivalent to a major earthquake. If you are anywhere downtown, you probably heard it and felt it. From across the city, 11 fire engines race downtown. Firefighter Chris Fields is one of the first on the scene. You just see these hordes of people running towards us and having no idea what we were about to step into. District Fire Chief Mike Shannon arrives four minutes after he hears the explosion. Looks like that, that we were in a war zone and we've been strafed. It was just overwhelming. He takes charge of the rescue squads about to enter the dangerously unstable ruins. Uh, produces a type of carnage that isn't seen in earthquakes or tornadoes or anywhere else. Wow. Holy cow. About a third of the building has been blown away. More than 5,000 square meters of offices are reduced to 650 square meters of rubble. The frantic search for survivors begins. On the remains of the second floor, Credit Union Chief Florence Rogers stares into a gaping hole. I started wondering about the staff in the room with me. They were gone in a, in a swish. Florence is helped down to the pedestrian plaza just below her second floor window. It took a few minutes after I was even out of there to realize that they hadn't run away. They hadn't left my office. They had literally been taken away by all the floors on top of them. But why does Florence survive when all eight of her colleagues vanish under the rubble? The answer will provide a crucial lead to investigators trying to unravel the disaster. Florence goes into shock. News cameras catch her wandering nearby, wrapped in a blanket. Nine oh eight. Seven blocks away, Dolores Watson hears the explosion. Her 20-month-old grandson, PJ, is in the daycare center on the first floor. Only there no longer is a first floor. She joins the flood of anxious parents rushing to the scene. In my mind, I was thinking, is this real? I know it was real, I'm looking at it, but a big part of me was wanting to say, this is not really happening. Rescuers claw through the tons of mangled steel and rubble, desperately searching for any sign of life in the debris. Even seasoned fireman Mike Shannon is shocked by the scene of devastation. You're trying not to be emotional. And you're trying to think logical. But your mind keeps going back to what you're expecting to find. Rescuers begin to find people alive. One is a baby boy. He's rushed to hospital in critical condition. It's PJ. And I saw his little face, and he was wrapped all in these gauze, and he was sedated, and he was laying there. But, I mean, there was his arms, there was his legs, and there was my baby, you know. They told me that his chance of survival was, were, were very slim and that the next 24 hours would be crucial. Ten twenty, seventy-eight 78 minutes after the explosion. While PJ remains in intensive care and the rescuers are struggling to pull out people alive, 97 kilometers to the north of Oklahoma City, State Highway Patrolman Charlie Hanger pulls over a suspicious battered old car. Drove up alongside the yellow Mercury Marquis. 
I had realized that there was not a tag displayed on the rear bumper and stopped it. I saw a tall, young, white male. We met more or less between the two cars. I asked him for a driver's license. However, while he was retrieving that license, I saw what appeared to be a weapon under the jacket. Hands over your head. He says, my weapon is loaded. At that point, I thought he was trying to intimidate me, and I nudged him a little bit with the barrel of my weapon. I said, so is mine. I removed the weapon, threw it on the shoulder of the roadway. And he was then handcuffed and placed in my unit. Officer Hanger checks the man's ID. There's a Michigan driver's license. I looked at the picture, and it appeared to be the same individual I had stopped. And it did list Timothy James McVeigh uh, as the name. He arrests McVeigh for the missing license plate and the loaded gun. 10.28, 86 minutes after the explosion. Back at the Murrah building, rescuers have come across something other than a victim in the rubble. They said they thought they'd found another uh, explosive device. There's panic, and the rescue operation comes to an abrupt halt while the bomb squad investigates. 54 minutes later, they sound the all clear. It's a false alarm. But rescuers have lost precious time. Now they're back amongst the carnage as vital minutes tick by. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Dana Bradley has been trapped in the rubble for five hours, as these images show. There was blood going through the concrete that was lying over me. Someone else's blood. All she can remember is standing on the ground floor with her mother and children, watching the rider truck park. Dana has been found hours earlier, but can't be moved. Her leg is trapped under a massive concrete floor. If they're to save her, the rescuers have only one option. And they said, the only way we're going to be able to get you out of here is to cut your leg off. Dr. Andy Sullivan, senior orthopedic surgeon, rushes to the scene. I just kind of said a prayer, God be with me, and, and kind of combat crawled into the area. Have to, had to go under some rebar, reinforcement steel. My plan was to use just sharp instruments and separate the leg from the thigh through the knee. I was awake and aware of them cutting my leg off. She was awake. She was screaming. And they said the sound was so bad, it broke their heart to hear me scream like that. She says she doesn't remember any of this, and so I hope that's true. It takes 11 hours to recover all the survivors. 168 people have died as a result of the explosion, including 19 children, all under the age of five. A photo of a baby being carried from the rubble comes to symbolize the tragedy. It's taken only seconds after she's handed to fireman Chris Fields. And I was just standing there looking down at her and just thinking, you know, that knowing this is somebody's baby. She had an open wound to her skull, and I pretty well knew at that time that she had already passed. The explosion and collapse of the building takes everyone by surprise. Oklahoma City had never suffered such a catastrophic disaster until this moment. But it takes just seven seconds for the nine-story building to collapse. Using the investigators' data, we can piece together the deadly chain of events to find out what really caused this terrible tragedy. 
state-of-the-art computer graphics will take you where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. It's obvious from the scale of devastation that this is not an accident, but the result of a bomb explosion. What kind of bomb could cause such devastation? Investigators start by looking for any evidence left behind. A giant crater in the road in front of the Murrah building indicates the center of the explosion. Dr. Paul Malaka is a military blast expert and co-author of the official report into the Oklahoma bombing. What we did is use the crater size to estimate the size of the explosion. It was a question of working backwards. We now have the crater, so how big must the explosive have been? The bomb crater is nine meters wide and two and a half meters deep. We estimated that it was approximately 4,000 pounds of TNT. That's equal to four major battlefield bombs used by the US military. Eyewitness accounts place the Ryder truck at the heart of the crater. It's clear to investigators the bomb must have been inside. To demonstrate what happens, a truck is filled with just half the amount of explosives that detonated outside the Murrah building that morning. The bomb that explodes in Oklahoma City destroys virtually everything close to the blast, including the vehicle that carried it. But within an hour of the explosion, investigators find their first vital piece of evidence. Over 91 meters away, they discover a truck axle that doesn't seem to belong to any other vehicle. Could this be all that is left of the vehicle that carried the bomb? On the twisted metal, they discover the clearly marked vehicle identification number. FBI agents trace the number to a 1993 Ford truck owned by Ryder Rental. The Ryder branch in Junction City, Kansas, rented it two days earlier to a man named Robert Kling. Within eight hours of the bombing, an FBI artist draws an identical picture of Kling based on descriptions given by staff at the rental company. The FBI launches one of the biggest manhunts in American history. By evening the next day, they make the crucial breakthrough. A motel owner recognizes the identical picture as a man who recently stayed there, driving a Ryder truck. He checks in using ID in the name of Timothy James McVeigh. But where is he now? FBI agents discover that State Trooper Hanger ran a computer check on a man with that name less than two hours after the bombing. Amazingly, they discover that McVeigh is still in jail for traffic and firearms offenses. The FBI arrest McVeigh as a suspect in the attack. It was something that you never envisioned being involved in. You know, and it all came out of a routine traffic stop. Four months later, McVeigh is charged with mass murder in Oklahoma. It would probably be the last thing that I would think of that an American would actually commit a terrorist act uh, against American people. The FBI discover that the bomb is homemade from materials easily bought over the counter. McVeigh eventually admits that he made it by filling barrels with ammonium nitrate and liquid nitromethane better known as fertilizer pellets and rocket fuel used in drag car racing. The deadly mixture of more than 3,000 kilograms cost less than $5,000. But the question remains, how could such a simple homemade bomb cause such destruction to a steel-reinforced concrete building? A bomb explodes outside the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. 
In just seven seconds, it collapses, killing 161 people. It's not just a great human tragedy, but a devastating blow to national security. The FBI tracked down and arrest Timothy McVeigh, the man responsible. Now the investigation shifts focus. How can a crude homemade bomb cause such devastation? Is there a fatal flaw in the Murrah's design that could put similar office buildings at risk? The architecturally acclaimed Murrah building is in fact extremely well designed. Oklahoma is in the middle of the Midwestern tornado belt. The Murrah is built from steel reinforced concrete used in military bunkers, able to withstand winds of up to 160 kilometers per hour. So why did McVeigh's simple homemade bomb cause it to collapse so catastrophically? Investigators track the last moments of McVeigh's journey second by second. At 9.01, just 73 seconds before the building's collapse, he parks the truck packed with explosives. He deliberately chooses a place where his bomb will inflict maximum damage. The rear of the building, beside one of the four columns that support the floors above. The bomb explodes. In just seven seconds, the Murrah is reduced to rubble. What happens during those seven seconds now becomes the focus of the inquiry. The ruins of the building hold the vital clues that will provide answers. Dr. John Osteras is a renowned structural engineer who analyzes how buildings collapse. Part of my expertise is being able to read buildings. I can form sort of a, a, a three-dimensional mental image of, of what's going on. It would tell me how the building had responded. You see the patterns of how, how beams and columns broke apart. For Dr. Rosteras, the broken floors and twisted columns are key pointers in working out exactly how the building reacts following the bomb blast. This film of a military test shows what happens during an explosion. The first stage is the bomb's lightning-fast blast wave. As the bomb's energy is released, it compresses air particles in its path to create a shock wave. This compressed air travels faster than the speed of sound, sweeping away everything in its path. The blast wave goes through the, the building in a blink of an eye. So we, we can break it down in, into what happens millisecond by millisecond. A millisecond is one thousandth of a second, about the time it takes for a person to blink twice or a bullet fired from a gun to travel one meter. So to understand how the catastrophe unfolds, we'll use unique computer simulations to slow down the chain of events. Millisecond by millisecond, we'll see how the blast wave cuts through the building to answer the tragic question of why so many die. Seven seconds before collapse, the bomb explodes. In the first millisecond, one thousandth of a second, the shock wave covers 4.75 meters, traveling at five kilometers per second, and hits the closest part of the building, the column McVeigh parked next to. Engineers call this column G20. The blast wave hits G20 with immense power. Dr. Malaka is an explosives expert. Researching his report into the bombing, he conducts scale model blast tests on concrete columns with the same dimensions and properties as G20. As the air blast expands violently, it exerts this enormous pressure on anything in its path. Dr. Malaka calculates that the shock wave hits the pillar with a force of more than 350 kilograms per square centimeter, destroying it. To put that in perspective, a 100 mile an hour hurricane wind is much less than one 
pound per square inch, so these blast pressures were enormous. Dr. Malaka and his colleagues feed their test data into the $100 million supercomputer of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This helps them visualize a blast wave as it penetrates a building like the Mara. They discover that one millisecond after destroying G20, the blast wave hits the glass-covered rear of the building. The facade of the building provided almost no resistance to the air blast. Military high-speed film shows what it's like when a blast wave hits a wall of glass. The windows are turned into a hailstorm of deadly shards. After shattering its windows, the blast wave penetrates the Murrah's entrance lock. I knew that was just it, and I prayed. The void of the atrium acts like a funnel. Channeling the deadly blast wave up into the building, it slams into the underside of the first floor at more than 16,000 kilometers per hour. Tragically, directly above is the children's daycare center, where baby PJ and 20 other children are playing. 15 children, aged from six months to five years, are killed. After eight milliseconds, the blast wave reaches the second floor, where Florence Rogers is holding a meeting. It was like a bad dream. Everything literally was blowing up before my eyes. The blast wave continues to surge up through the building. It reaches the eighth floor in just 31 milliseconds, the time it takes for a vehicle airbag to inflate after a crash. But as it travels upwards, it is rapidly losing its destructive energy. The yellow highlight shows how the damage decreases as the blast wave rises through the building and shows that floors four and above remain intact. The blast wave is over. But it's what happens next that causes the greatest destruction. In less than seven seconds, all nine stories collapse. Those who survived the initial blast are now crushed under tons of falling concrete. Investigators must now find out what causes this second wave of destruction. A massive homemade bomb has torn through the Mara Federal Building in Oklahoma City. 161 people lose their lives, even though many survived the initial blast. The blast was powerful enough to damage only the lower floors of the nine-story building. Investigators now struggle to understand why the upper floors collapsed as well. In an effort to solve the mystery, they revisit the first moments of the explosion. As the blast wave spreads, it destroys the closest frontal column, known as G20, in less than four milliseconds. Above the remaining three columns is a massive girder, known as a transfer beam, that runs the length of the building. This transfer beam carries the weight of the six floors above. These floors in turn are held up by nine columns. These nine columns pass the building's weight down to the transfer beam, which then distributes it evenly across the four pillars below. At first, some experts believe that after destroying G20, the blast then damages two more pillars under the transfer beam. With the pillars blown away, the beam loses its support and falls, taking all the upper floors with it. But the position of the transfer beam in the rubble doesn't support this theory. It hasn't fallen straight down as it would if the columns had collapsed beneath it. 
Instead, the transfer beam is discovered lying inside the building, suggesting it's been pulled inwards. It was in the debris pile behind the columns, so it was supported on this column, and it was found in the debris pile behind the column. For Dr. Osteras and his colleagues, the location of the collapsed transfer beam provides the vital clue. They can now piece together what happens in those crucial seven seconds after the explosion. The blast destroys G20, but does not destroy the other three columns and the transfer beam. With the building still intact, the blast wave then rips through the atrium of the Murrah. It smashes into the floors above at more than 16,000 kilometers per hour. There are eight stories of concrete floor slabs in the Murrah connected to nine supporting columns. But the second floor is also connected to the transfer beam that holds up the columns. This proves a critical factor as the blast wave powers through the building. Dr. Eve Hinman, a blast expert, worked with Dr. Osteras on the investigation. I think of the floor slabs often as um, the sail, like a sail on a sailboat, because they have so much surface area that the blast can act on. The blast forces up the floor slabs on the lower four stories. Blast pressure comes in, lifts the floor slab up, and the floor slabs just come up and, and shear off the columns, and then gravity takes over. And, and down they come. And so within milliseconds, we got a uh, collapse of uh, floor slabs on the second through fifth floor. About 100 milliseconds after the explosion, the time it takes for the human brain to recognize an image, the third and fourth floors collapse onto the second, which is still attached to the transfer beam. This added weight means the second floor also gives way. But crucially, its connection to the transfer beam remains intact. The beam is ripped off the columns by the falling floor and dragged into the building. My theory is that when the floor slabs came down, they pulled the transfer girder in. The transfer girder rolled over. As that third floor slab collapsed, and fell into the debris, it is, it is pulling on the top edge of, of the transfer beam. And there's nothing to resist that force. 100 milliseconds after the blast, the transfer beam is pulled down and around by the falling floor. 200 milliseconds after the blast, the falling transfer beam sets off what engineers call progressive collapse. Progressive collapse is collapse that that spreads beyond the initial zone of damage. One second after the blast, progressive collapse begins to destroy the Mara building. You knock over one domino, and that falls and it knocks over the next and so on, and, and you get this progressive chain reaction. The transfer beam is the critical element or domino in the Mara. It supports the columns that, in turn, support the seven stories above. With the transfer beam gone, the upper floors are fatally weakened, and the building begins to collapse. Gravity takes another five seconds or so uh, to bring the building down. It's all over in seven seconds. This is the time it takes the ninth story floor to drop the 31 meters to the ground. More than 5,000 square meters of steel reinforced concrete collapses into a two story high pile of rubble. It really isn't the air blast that's hurting people, it is the building that is hurting people. Among those killed by the collapsing building are Florence Rogers' eight employees who are with her on the second floor. As the floor slabs collapse, only she survives because she's sitting directly over a supporting beam on the opposite wall from the explosion that remains undamaged. 
didn't realize what a small little portion of my floor didn't break away. Someone said there was only about 18 inches left that, that didn't break away. Engineers now know why McVeigh's crude bomb causes such devastation. But was it inevitable? Today, there's an awful realization that an extra $100,000 spent on the construction of the building could have prevented its collapse. April 19, 1995 is a date Oklahoma City will never forget. The day 168 people are killed when a massive truck bomb explodes outside the Murrah Federal Building. But could the building's devastating collapse have been prevented? A new seismic study has assessed how the Murrah building would have responded if it had been built to Californian earthquake-resistant standards, something not required in Oklahoma. Its conclusions are startling. It reveals that only one exterior column and the lower floors would have been damaged. As their computer simulation shows, the building would have remained intact. To meet the earthquake-resistant code, the whole building would have been strengthened with much more reinforced steel. This added steel would have tied the building together and stopped the fatal failure of the transfer beam. The catastrophic progressive collapse would never have happened. It would have cost less than 1% of the building's original construction budget, around $100,000. The study suggests four out of five of those killed may then have survived. But in 1977, when the Murrah was built, no one ever imagined that it would be the target of a terrorist attack. Those who lived through that terrible day in 1995 still bear the scars. PJ is one of only six children from the daycare center who survived. His grandmother, Dolores Watson, mounted a tense vigil beside baby PJ's incubator. For nine years, he's lived with a tracheotomy tube down his throat to help him breathe. It was only removed in 2003. I made the statement once that when the trach was out, that PJ and I would be able to move from April 19th to April 20th. But each day when this child looks in the mirror, the scars are still there. As their second floor office fell to the ground, Florence Rogers lost 18 of her 33 colleagues at the credit union. Nothing has ever been the same or ever will be the same. It literally changes your life forever. She recruited new staff and re-established the company. Then she retired. The falling floors killed Dana Bradley's mother, her son, and three-year-old daughter. Dana survived the emergency amputation of her leg. Months of treatment followed, but Dana has achieved a miraculous recovery. We have your new prosthesis all finished up. Oh, man. It was, uh, wow. It was like, wow, I'm walking. Beautiful. I love it. I was strutting down the hallway. I loved it. The more I wanted to walk and the more I cared about living. Our special report. The remains of the Mara were destroyed five weeks after the attack. Five years later, the site opens as a national memorial to remember the 168 lives lost that day. The site commemorates the exact moment in time that hurt so many. The road the truck parked on is gone, replaced by a lake. There's one chair for every life lost. Man woman and child. 
Across the streets from the site of the Murrah, a new federal building opened in 2003. State of the art, its design incorporates key lessons learnt from April 19. There's no point for the building to stand after the event if everyone inside is, is killed. It's about saving people. The lobby, the entrance that funneled so much of the explosion into the Murrah, is now protected by two-centimeter steel blast shields. The glass is new-generation blast-proof material designed not to shatter. But the most effective measure to prevent a repeat of the tragedy is also the cheapest. Ram-proof bollards surround the building's perimeter, so no one can park close to it. This simple step would have stopped McVeigh driving his truck up to the Murrah and limited the destruction that followed. Timothy McVeigh is found guilty of mass murder and executed by lethal injection on June 11, 2001, 74 months after his bomb kills 168 people. But the stark reality remains. There's little that can be done to stop a determined terrorist who decides to target innocent civilians. Most office buildings around the world are just as vulnerable as the Murrah. If a bomb went off outside them, they would react just as catastrophically as the Murrah in those fatal seven seconds at 9.02 on April 19, 1995.